Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to the New Leadership in Times of Pandemic um, Forum. I am Larry Concepcion, your uh, Masters of Ceremonies for this morning's forum. Uh, the, I am the liaison director for uh, Women in Finance. Um, we will be starting our program uh, by doing it right and saying our invocation. So let us all put ourselves in the presence of the Lord. Alex, can you flash the prayer, please? Okay, Father God, all glory and honor and blessing, all power and might, all praise and thanksgiving be to you, Abba Father, to us all. We stand on your word, declaring that when we, declaring that when we call upon you, you will answer us and be with us in distress. You will answer us and be with us in distress. So next page, please. Our deliverer and dealer, we seek your protection for our families and all of us from the scourge of COVID-19 and all manner of disease and affliction. We pray especially for our health workers who tirelessly perform their duties at great risk to themselves. We pray for all of us co-workers in the business community that we may perform our tasks with greater diligence in these difficult times to serve each other and our country in solidarity and spirit of social responsibility. We pray for all those in authority in government and the private sector, that they may have all wisdom, competence, and strength to lead us and serve through this period of crisis with special attention to our poor and disadvantaged brethren who are struggling to survive. We pray for reconciliation and peace among all Filipinas as we come to better realize our oneness as people in good times and bad, as a common dread unites us. So in acknowledgement of our dependence on you and in obedience, we approach you, Father God, humble ourselves and pray, seek your presence and turn from our evil ways that you may listen from heaven, forgive our sins, and revive our land. In the loving name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let us now do our national anthem.
Okay, thank you. And my apologies for the delayed uh, flashing of the uh, screen. Okay, um, may I now call on uh, Jose Jerome R. Pascual III, Phoenix President, and uh, Jeng is also the CFO, Vice President for Finance, and he is the Treasurer for Pilipina Shell. Jeng? Uh, thank you very much, Larry. Um, Good morning, Phoenix members and guests. Uh, welcome to today's webinar on new leadership in times of pandemic, sponsored by the Phoenix Women in Finance Committee. Um, as a CFO of a publicly listed company that is associated with one of the world's most valuable, valuable brands, uh, leading a finance function spread across different locations and businesses and through a recent major reorganization, can be particularly challenging. Um, and add on to that, the high degree of difficulty resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic, one that is redefining our ways of working and impacting our mental well-being. I lead a finance team that is highly diverse, whether in gender or generation terms. Uh, around 60% of my finance team is female and mostly millennials and Gen Xers, with only one baby boomer, which is me. Uh, when, I <laughs> when I encounter leadership dilemmas, or simply need to, to, to coach my team members on how to deal with adaptive challenges, I reflect on my previous experiences, as well as learnings from the books I've read. My go-to reference book is not one written by John Maxwell, uh, Ken Blanchard, or Simon Sinek, but a book written by Alan and Barbara Peace entitled Why Men Don't Listen and Women Can't Read Maps. It is a book based on hard scientific evidence and years of research, but using relatable everyday scenarios to explain why men and women are different. According to Alan and Barbara, men are programmed to be courageous, focused, strategic, and competitive while women are hardwired to be sensitive, observant, nurturing, and great in multitasking. I originally bought the book to understand my wife better, but it turned out to be very useful in helping me understand what it takes to lead a diverse and complex organization. The greatest insight for me was not about why the men and women in my team behave differently, it was about me being able to learn and exhibit both masculine and feminine characteristics in my leadership style. Male values play a big part in driving people to the top of the organization, but female values are the key to staying there. We are privileged to have with us today distinguished speakers who will share with us their own insights on leadership and its importance in these uncertain times. Ms. Victoria Francisco, uh, HR Principal Specialist from the Asian Development Bank, and as I recently found out, a 9-11 survivor. And uh, Ms. Lewis Williams, uh, Senior Director for um, Economic Growth of DT, uh, DT Global. They will be properly introduced shortly. We also have with us Ms. Nikki Tang, CEO of Demark Beauty Corporation, who will be moderating the discussion and open forum. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the Phoenix Women in Finance Committee, chaired by Ms. Terry Magleo, with Liaison Director Larry Concepcion, Gay Santos, Edith DeChao, and the Phoenix Secretariat for making this webinar possible. And thank you everyone for being with us this morning. Back to you, Larry. Okay, thank you, Jang. Um, next, I will be introducing to you uh, the leader behind all of these activities, a very hardworking uh, committee chair, none other than um, Terry Magleya. So um, other than her being a chairperson for women in finance, she's also the CFO for Pinamics Technologies, Inc. Okay, Terry, over to you. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes, Okay. Loud and clear. Thank you, Larry. That was a very nice introduction. And thank you also, President Jen, for the warm opening remarks. My fellow officers, members, guests, participants, 
a pleasant and beautiful morning. I'm Terry Magleo, and chairperson of Women in Finance Committee of Phoenix. Having been actively engaged in technology, particularly fintech and digitalization through Painamics Technologies Inc., I'm so excited to learn more from our highly distinguished speakers on the value of innovation and new leadership techniques in times of global pandemic. COVID-19 crisis is a once-in-a-century event and no training experience in previous downturns has equipped us for it. If you can recall, for those who attended our last webinar, today's theme is a sequel of our rising up to the challenges of the new order that encourage us to maximize our potentials in modeling self-care amidst pandemic and navigating personally and professionally the new normal. But daunting stress from workforce instability, escalated safety and health risk, mounting work from home challenges, meeting performance targets, and financial woes can quickly become a sprazzle. With these extreme pressures on physical and mental health, leaders need to tap their own emotional intelligence and grit to make sure their teams come out of the pandemic stronger. Social and emotional support and understanding are the key ingredients in helping alleviate stress and adjust to work-life expectations. In these continued grim times and tremendous ambiguity amidst pandemic, there is a heightened reliance on leaders, managers, and supervisors to maintain well-being, health, and safety of their workforce while ensuring the survival of the business and organization as a whole. New leaders must demonstrate decisiveness, yet flexible expectations. We need to support and coach our teams through uncertain times by helping them feel secure and prepared for the future. Above all, we must balance pandemic challenges and uncertainty with empathy and compassion. On the other hand, how are we going to reimagine the future as Jaza mentioned on his talk at Ayale Phoenix Summit recently? What are the new ways of reaching out to customers and reviewing our commitment to broader communities? Innovation in a time of crisis presents an opportunity for the digitalization. Digitalization has been available, but its value is only magnified and intensified during this pandemic period, not only in the corporate sector, but also in government and nonprofit organizations. As a backdrop, there are 663 local government unit officials or LGUs under investigation and anomalies about social amelioration program or SAP or cash aid. 397 and counting of which are already charged with corruption. Apart from this, Phil Health and Department of Health are also embroiled on COVID-related corruption issues. Tracking of COVID cases has been hard enough. Monitoring and investigating of corruption cases, if any, is even harder. Should have been the national ID system and the digitalization implemented earlier, provision of humanitarian assistance and services could have been faster, more efficient, and cost-effective. Technology could have helped track the COVID cases more accurately and release the testing result much, much earlier. Distribution of cash aid could have been quicker and corruption could have been minimized if not totally weeded out. As such, pandemic is redefining new leadership as we are re-strategizing, re-prioritizing, and coping with extraordinary demands. This poses an ultimate test of our character and litmus test of our leadership as we work weather this COVID-19 crisis and emerge stronger from it. We are powerless in managing, we are not powerless in managing and leading through pandemic. We just need to reframe the challenges to help us cope with them by learning new leadership techniques through heightened leadership capabilities to be discussed by Ms. Victoria Francisco Arvina. And uh, let's not forget review, to review also our commitment to broader communities by adopting innovation through digitalization for development and humanitarian assistance 
by Miss Louis Williams. But before we proceed any further, let us thank President Cheng, the program participants of the Women in Finance Committee, Gay, Nikki, Larry, and Edith, and our ever hardworking secretariat, Mike, uh, Jam, Rafi, Lynn, Alex, for putting all this together. And of course, special thanks to our renowned speakers to be introduced later by an active member of the committee, Ms. Edith Li Chow. Let us all be grateful. It's 193 days since lockdown. We are healthy. We are here now listening and hopeful. 91 days till Christmas. Now is the time to showcase our newly acquired attributes of new leadership. To all of us here, the emerging new leaders and innovators, when pandemic and uncertainty continues to strike, let us lead humanity and technology. To God be the glory. Thank you. Back to you, Larry. Okay, thank you, Terry. Okay, that was a very inspiring message. So we now call on another um, colleague in the Women in Finance, uh, who will be introducing our guest speakers and our moderator. So um, well, let's welcome Edith Dichau, um, Brand Ambassador, Forecasting and Planning Technologies, Inc. So Edith will actually be uh, touching on the uh, guidelines for this um, uh, briefing and probably to be followed by the Q&A. So over to you, Edith. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Good morning. Can you yes, hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Yes. Okay, okay clear. thank you. Yeah. Good morning to everyone. I hope everyone is having a good day today. Anyway, uh, we will have two very uh, great speakers uh, for today's webinar. And uh, I will introduce them one at a time. They will give their uh, piece. After that, uh, we will have a Q&A after they give their speech, but you can type in your questions in our uh, Q&A box here uh, in Zoom. And then we will have a moderator. We will have about 20 to 30 minutes to answer all your questions from our very uh, great speakers for today. Anyway, uh, let me start. The first speaker that we have today is a great lady. She is a global human resources professional with experience in global financial services, banking and insurance, such as Bank of Tokyo, Mitsubishi uh, Limited in New York, American Express Travel Related Services Company as Director of Human Resources, also in New York, and the New York Life Insurance Company as its Corporate Vice President and Human Resources. She has also done uh, work in the higher education industry, such as the New York University as the Director for the Human Resources. And she has all ventured in the high-end retail industry and worked for the Tiffany & Company as, its, uh, as part of its Human Resources uh, group. She has also been active in the public and the government sector. Progressive experience in strategic and tactical roles, strong focus on leadership development, talent management, employee relations, training, and organization effectiveness. She has proven ability to build collaborative relationships at all levels. An excellent thought leader, strong results-oriented person, creative problem sol solver. She is, she is also a, a dynamic people leader with excellent coaching and mentoring abilities. And most of all, it says, and I believe she is one, an, ex an excellent public speaker with a vibrant aura. In terms of her background, I, uh, she is a, a certified coach uh, uh, being given the certification by the Associate Certified Coach from International Coach Federation of the U.S. She, is also, uh, she also holds a certificate in human resources management uh, given by the Chartered, Chartered Institute of Personal Development in London, a certified assessor uh, by the Mayor Solovi Caruso Emotional Intelligence Test in the U.S., and she also got her certificate for human resources management at the Cornell University in New York, a holder of a journalism certificate in Northwestern University in Chicago, 
As for her uh, undergraduate degree, she finished her Bachelor of Arts in Social Science, Sciences at the Ateneo de Manila University. And uh, just to add uh, how well she has done and uh, give uh, recommendations or commendations given by her co-professionals, Ellen Bloom said, Vicky is the parag Vina is the paragon of emotional intelligence with the mastery of the compliance and legal issues surrounding global employee relations issues. Her integrity is unquestionable. Her intelligence is acute and her manner and style are an asset in the HR professional. Another colleague said, uh, Victoria is a consummate human resources professional who thinks strategically. She is also fun to work with. And lastly, as mentioned by Jeng, our president, Vina is one of the survivors of the 9-11 uh, incident. And she gets interviewed by a lot, such as Philippine Star and CNN Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, our first speaker is currently the Principal Human Resources Specialist at the Asian Development Bank. Please welcome Ms. Victoria Vina Francisco. Okay, I'm trying to start my video. Let's start. Okay, there. It's. Am I on? Yes. Uh, I haven't seen your video. Hold on. We can see you now. Okay, great. So um, uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to be uh, one of your speakers for today. Uh, you know, I normally don't speak outside of uh, the Asian Development Bank's realm, uh, or at least with organizations that are associated with the bank. So I actually had to get special permission to do this. And I worked hard to get that because I was very um, honored when Terry got in touch with me and she asked me to share my, my knowledge and my expertise with the group. So um, everything that you heard Terry say today is really spot on. Uh, the importance of leadership, the heightened importance of leadership now as we're going through a pandemic. So with this very esteemed group that I'm speaking with today, I know I'm actually speaking to the choir because you would not have reached uh, you know, this, this level of seniority in your careers if you did not understand uh, the importance of, of leadership. You're all leaders in your organization and I know you understand that even now more than ever, it is very critical uh, to examine the purpose and future of your organization. And um, you know, having the right leaders in the right place at the right time could be that one defining factor for, for success. So my goal today is to leave you with some thought provoking and maybe potentially, you know, organizational, you know, altering concepts that you can apply to your talent strategies going forward. Uh, I will provide you with definitions and descriptors of who are high potential staff who can be future leaders in your organization. So in a way, I want this to be interactive because I want you to walk away from, from my 20 minute session with a tool that can at least get you started in thinking about your talent. Uh, right now in this pandemic, we're all in survival mode. You know, everybody's just trying to get the work done in the quickest and the best way possible. But it's also a very good time to start observing and looking at your talent pool. Why is that? because there's no better time to look at how people are going to step up right, than in times of crisis. And that's something that uh, I learned through 9-11 and that's something that I've already observed through this pandemic. So before I start, can I please ask that my talent exercise be shared? If you can just flash that on the screen. Okay, so this 
this table can actually be emailed to you if you ask for it, uh, but it might be easier for you to just take a screenshot for now. And basically what I want you to do as I speak to these dimensions is I want you to just instinctively think of people on your teams and as you hear me describe the attributes and the profile of a high performing staff, maybe you can just put an X mark, right? On which dimensions, uh, just tick off the dimensions that you feel are applicable to them now. At the end of the exercise, you may uh, decide that you've come up with the right list or maybe it's the wrong list, but it will at least give you something to start with, something to work on uh, as you think about your talent. Now, the dimensions that I'm going, going to cover are not uh, you know, the dimensions prescribed by ADB or prescribed by American Express. These are actually a compilation of uh, you know, different practices I've seen in different organizations. But may, based on my experience as an HR professional and as a coach, uh, these are the dimensions that, in my experience working with middle-level managers and senior managers, in my experience, this is the combination that works best. Okay. So if you've all had a chance to take a screenshot of that and maybe uh, think of who are some of the staff that you want to plot against this chart, then I'll get started with, with, uh, with my presentation. So can we put the PowerPoint back on? Okay, can we switch to the next page? Okay, so what is potential? Potential is a future prediction of a person's ability to take on leadership roles in the future. So it's not simply a measure of current performance although there is a high correlation between being a high potential and also being a high performer, but not vice versa. Um, and I, I can explain more about that when we go into the Q&A uh, after my presentation. So next page, please. Okay, so I'm going to cover seven dimensions that paint the profile of a high potential professional, okay? The first is breadth and depth of experience. And when I talk about breadth and depth, I'm actually looking at two data points. The first data point is diversity of experience. Why? Because somebody who has diverse experience has a broader and a deeper perspective. Um, I think we heard um, uh, one of our earlier uh, speakers, you know, refer to himself as drawing from previous experience, right? Drawing from, from uh, a multitude of uh, experience in different business environments that has given him insight, right? On how to lead his team through the pandemic. So how do you look for this diversity, okay? This type of profile will not fit a person, for example, who has been in the same function for you know, double number of years doing the same job, okay? That is not the definition of diverse experience. So a diverse professional would have experience across different, uh, a multitude of different business settings and environments, possibly working in different functional areas across several industries, and also global experience. You know, as the word has become more global, and we're all functioning you know, on the digital platform, on a global platform, that experience of having worked right, in more than one country can add a lot of depth to somebody's experience. Okay? The second data point, other breadth and depth of experience, is experience working in challenging environments. Now, typically, what are some of these challenging environments? Somebody who's worked with in a mergers and acquisition environment somebody who has experienced launching a new product, somebody who has been part of a large scale business initiative. And now very obviously, somebody who is working through this pandemic, right, already has that, that uh, experience of working in a challenging business environment. So, you know, resumes being prepared right now 
uh, that's actually something that you can add on, right? That you've had experience working in finance in a crisis, or in my case, you are working in HR in a crisis, because uh, anybody who digs deep into that will, will, will realize that there's a lot of breadth and depth in the type of experience that comes with that. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, the next slide, the next dimension is behavioral traits and characteristics. So this speaks to your natural inclination and behavior. And here I'm gonna look at four data points. Number one is persistence. So a high, high potential person is steadfast and tenacious in the pursuit of their goals. The second data point is somebody who's comfortable with ambiguity. Now, what does that mean? That type of person can make decisions even with the lack of full information. So we're all in the business world, right? So what is one of the cliches that we like to use? Analysis paralysis, right? Where people can't get beyond what they don't see. Okay? Now, so the type of person who is high potential is comfortable with that and is willing to take that risk to make a timely decision when the situation calls for it, even in the absence of complete information. This person, third data point under behavioral traits, this person is assertive. They like to take charge, they like to direct others. And the last data point is one of my favorites. This person is positive and optimistic. They see the world as half full, or they see the glass as half full as opposed to half empty. Next slide, please. I'm trying to move quickly because I am conscious of time. So the third uh, dimension is emotional intelligence. Now this is not a new concept. This has been around for double years. I personally subscribe to the Daniel Goldman approach to emotional intelligence because I was personally trained under Daniel Goldman when I was with American Express. And here I highlight four data points. An emotionally intelligent person is self-aware. They know their self-worth. They know their strengths and weaknesses. They have ability to read their own emotions and they understand how they will respond and react to different environments and uh, you know, different uh, business settings. The second data point is self-management. So an emotionally intelligent person can control their impulses. Uh, they're not volatile. Uh, they know how to keep their disruptive emotions in check. And they also exhibit trustworthiness, honesty, and consensuousness. The third data point is social awareness. They have empathy. They can read the emotions of others. Very, very importantly, they understand organizational dynamics, the politics of an organization, and they know when to pick their battles. Okay? The fourth data point is social skills. And this just doesn't mean that somebody is friendly. Okay? The definition of social skills under the bucket of emotional intelligence is somebody who genuinely enjoys working with people. They like to collaborate. They're highly collaborative. They like working in teams. And they like that team effort and that collaborative effort in getting the work done. Okay. Next dimension, please. Okay. Next dimension, very important, especially now, uh, as we go through this pandemic, somebody who's com comfortable with change and innovation. So this person embraces change. They uh, explore possibilities. You know, they're bold enough to go where others fear to tread, right? They're willing to try a, uh, a brand new idea, you know, even if it hasn't been tested, you know, if that's the only, and the only way to go. Now, um, ideally, a high potential person would undergo change management training, which is a whole other skill and whole other competency but learning to deal with change is actually a learned, um, it can be a learned trait. So if you already know that you're uncomfortable with change, then you can actually put yourself in situations where that competency will be challenged until you get to a level of comfort and confidence in dealing with it. Uh, I know Lois, uh, after me, is going to speak more about disruption and you know, digital innovation and just the very practical definition of disruption, right? We are now living in a very, very disrupted world. But one of the new buzz terms you're going to be hearing about is, you know, disruption innovation. You know, who is able to innovate in spite of the disruption? And I'm sure in the business world, 
we can talk about some of the companies, even locally in the Philippines, who are doing better uh, and probably can be very successful in this type of an environment, precisely because they are comfortable with change and they've been able to adapt, right, and innovate in this disruptive environment. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, influences and inclinations. Okay, this defines really, in a way, what your role preferences are. Do you want to be an individual contributor or do you want to be a people leader? So one of the uh, descriptors also for this dimension is somebody who likes to have power. Now, that may come across a little negatively. I remember earlier in my career when I was taking these assessments, I was very hesitant to pick power as an attribute that was important to me. Um, personally, my choice uh, of attribute or, or, or descriptor is actually the word authority. I like to have the authority to influence decision, to make decisions. I want to have the authority to influence strategy. Uh, but the truth is, if you have that authority, that also actually means you have the power. So it's really a personal choice of which word you're more comfortable with, power or authority. Uh, a high, a high uh, potential person likes to manage teams and works with people, uh, very team oriented, highly collaborative, and that really is their, their preference to get the work done as a team as opposed to uh, getting the work done as an individual contributor. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so this is my sixth dimension. And this is a term that you will likely never see on print. <laughs> it can be a little controversial, but I actually like to use it uh, for the dramatic effect of it because I think it speaks to itself. So what do I consider a fatal flaw? A fatal flaw really is bad behavior. So we've all seen that in our, in our organizations. Uh, the type of person who yells and screams, the type of person who curses, the type of person who cuts people off in meetings and is not open to listening to the opinions of others. Okay, those are some of the bad behaviors that you may do very well in the six dimensions. You're great. You know, you tick all those boxes, but if you have a fatal flaw and it cannot be fixed or you cannot be coached or it cannot be changed, then in my view, that will scrap you right off the list of being a high potential, a high potential staff to be considered for, for future roles in the organization. And I always say some flaws, and some people will call this development needs. That's probably the more politically correct way to refer to a, a fatal flaw. Some of them are coachable, but some of them are not. So uh, as leaders and as HR people, we have to make that decision on whether something can be changed or you know something is just you know inherent in the character of the person and uh, we just move on from it okay and my last dimension is what i call the it factor so again this is controversial you won't see this in any written documents about high potential leadership etc um and even in adb when i use this term you know, my the vice president of human resources, you know, sort of just crinkles her nose at me. But what do I call the it factor? I also like to call it the likability factor, uh, the charisma factor. So all things being equal, right, in the first five dimensions, somebody's got the breadth and depth of experience. Somebody's got the, 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 uh, the correct traits and characteristics. They're emotionally intelligent. They're comfortable with change. You know, they're innovative, they're dynamic. Um, uh, they want to be a people leader. Uh, they want to work with teams. So all things being equal, you have two people who tick off all the right boxes. Sometimes there's just that one extra element uh, that gives you that sense that somebody will be more effective than the others. So if you had to choose, this can technically be your deal breaker right, or your, or your um, you know, tiebreaker. So it's the it factor, it's a likability factor, it's charisma, it's the presence of the person that actually makes them more attractive to other people than other people want to work for them. So in addition to all the great skills that they have, 
you know, they're also very likable and the type, they're the type of person that you want to have in the room, you want to have on your team, um, especially, you know, in times of crisis. So um, I'll stop my formal presentation here. Uh, I hope you were able to follow using the talent uh, tool sheet and uh, we can talk about it more during the Q&A. Uh, but as I said, if we don't have a chance to go discuss this talent sheet fully, I hope I've at least given you uh, a tool that you can walk away with and get a head start um, or even just you know, use it as a refresher to review the talent in your organization. So uh, with that, I'll stop here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Vina. Uh, let's uh, put our questions if you want at the end of the Q&A or in the chat group. Right now, I'd like to start uh, to introduce our next guest speaker, Ms. Lois Williams. Uh, hold on. Okay, Lois is the Senior Director currently uh, of DT Global, a relatively new company. And uh, as a background, Lois is a lawyer. Uh, is, she's also not working uh, as a consultant, but to go government as well. Anyway, for more than 20 years and with significant impact, uh, Lois has promoted economic growth through legal, regulatory, and institutional regimes that are transparent, accountable, and inclusive. Lois has conceived and implemented widely accessed tools that help facilitate private sector development, including, not to mention, USAID's BizClear and AgClear methodologies, uh, the Regional Agricultural Trade Environment Analysis, the USAID Systems Analytic Framework for the Digital Economy, and, and a Country Aligned Market Systems Development Tool. Lewis also helps in strengthening uh, systems of economic policymaking, public-private engagement, transparent governance, enterprise formalization, business licensing and permitting, access to credit, employing workers, and cross-border trade. As a principal associate and a practicing lead at the Nathan uh, Associates, uh, Lewis has led a range of women's economic empowerment initiatives with her work in, let's, uh, in 2010 by helping to facilitate a dramatic shift in how development agencies incorporate gender into their activities. Uh, her contributions include designing and championing the APEC Women and the Economy, ec economy Dashboard, APEC Women in Transportation Data Framework and Best Practices Initiative, APEC Women in STEM, APEC Women in Entrepreneurship, uh, in 2015, the USAID's Guidance for Integration of Gender Issues into Trade Capacity Building Projects in the Middle East and Asia. And of course, the monitoring of an evaluation component of Walmart's 2012 and 2013 Women in Factories program. As a technical expert, implementer, trainer, and champion for change, Lois' experience spans more than 50 economies across Central Europe, Eurasia, Asia, Oceania, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, Caribbean, and the Middle East, North America, and the Indian subcontinent. Lois is a proven manager, having led Nathan Associates' home office private sector development team and a range of field-based project teams, including a Activities in Jamaica, Ghana, Mozambique, Liberia, Papua New Guinea, Vietnam, the ASEAN region, Egypt, and North Macedonia. Luis has successfully led or contributed to the business development initiatives valued in the millions of dollars. And as a member and of the board of directors of the not-for-profit Star Island Corporation, which are operates a hotel and co or conference center on a historic property near Pot Portsworth, New Hampshire. Lewis has extensive experience in institutional oversight, strategic planning, and financial stewardship. Lewis participated in the company's COVID-19 crisis response team. Ladies and gentlemen, may we welcome 
another distinguished speaker, Ms. Lewis Williams. Lewis? Thank yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I, um, I have enjoyed the program so far, and I am so um, delighted to participate in this webinar with you today. Um, uh, I want to extend first my thanks to Phoenix and the Women in Finance Committee. Um, the, the work you do in advocacy and networking and helping others uh, understand their resources is so important and I'm inspired by your work. Um, can we go to my PowerPoint? I'll start there. Um, as we uh, as I transition to that, I want to say how much I enjoyed the scenes from your beautiful country um, during, during your national anthem. I have been to the Philippines a number of times, um, to Manila and to Cebu, and all of those beautiful scenes um, re reminded me the fla of the flavor of your lovely country. I want to quickly say my most delightful, wonderful, unforgettable experience in the Philippines was when I saw a dance performance in Cebu. Um, I've never seen anything like it. Hundreds of dancers, the most exquisite experience that I would love to share with anyone. So I just had to get that off my chest. And then next, I will also say, I want to thank my friend Gay Santos for inviting me today. You know, I, I have worked, you know, in and out of ASEAN or APEC and in the Philippines directly, and somehow all roads lead to Gay. Um, she is really a remarkably, you know, when we talk about leaders and a leader you want, I, I, I just have admired Gay for so long. Um, and her influence and, and you know, the, that combination of characteristics, I'm such a fan. But let me move into to my topic, um, hopefully as a matter of spurring conversation rather than, um, I'm not sure I have all the, I, I, really, I really did appreciate that list about leadership um, that we just talked about. If you go to my first slide, um, please, there. Um, so I, I'm sure uh, it's, it's hard to ignore uh, all the waves of consternation, honestly, coming out of the United States these days. And a, a lot of it we share with the world. I, I, I recognize a lot of the themes you've talked about today in terms of the pandemic, um, uh, in addition to the health crisis, the economic crisis. Um, in the United States in particular, the crisis has underscored um, inequalities across our societies with certain groups, usually marginalized groups, suffering more from the pandemic than our, most, our more privileged groups. Um, you may have heard that we have an election coming up soon. Um, and oh my goodness, it takes a lot of energy and it causes a lot of noise. We are also suffering from issues of climate change. Um, and so we've been thinking about all of that. But honestly, our world sort of stopped last weekend upon the death of um, a true American icon, and I would say a true leader. Um, I, I think the mourning, the outpouring of grief over the death of Justice Ruth Bader uh, Ginsburg um, is, is the grief over having to say goodbye to a great leader. Um, next slide, please. Um, Working backward from that list, I think in, in terms of thinking about leadership and why this person mattered, you know, she didn't join the Supreme Court till she was 60 years old. And it was, you know, uh, she spent 27 years on the court, but even before then, she was a remarkable leader as a lawyer, as an advocate, as, as a human being. Um, much of what she's known, especially for her work in gender equality, um, uh, you know, the, the days when women couldn't get a, a credit card without their husband's signature or um, or the if there was an executor to a will, it always was preferred to a man or our military academies were only for men. Even if they were public, they didn't let in women. She, she had a tremendous influence on all of this, as well as racial equality in terms of, of standing up for voting rights. Um, and all of her work had to do with economic opportunity and better outcomes for marginalized groups. Um, she, in many, for many years, was in the majority and then also was a major dissenting voice on our Supreme Court in the years that come. And um, sort of building on our last speaker's comments about leadership, before moving on about this woman, I want to 
say her, her famous quote about leadership is that one should fight for the things you care about, but do it in a way that bring others with you. So on to the next slide. And we're talking about that issue of disruption and digital digitalization, which is obviously has been sweeping the world for the past 10 years. Um, an inevitable force that 10 years ago was clearly very influential, but had, had not um, spread across the globe um, to the extent that it has today. And I think really in the past 10 years, um, we have seen the extent to which digital networks and, and related technologies enhance economic opportunity. Um, you know, uh, privileged groups have, have had that opportunity all along, have had access to information, access to finance, access to um, education. Uh, so for some groups that came very easily, but the amazing thing about the internet is that it has opened up the opportunity uh, to so many more people. And the outcomes for economies have been strengthened as well. There was such a productivity boom, especially at the beginning. I'm not sure we're, we're all that much more productive um, uh, every day because of technology. I mean, sometimes it's, it can be overwhelming, but I, I think, and certainly in this time of the pandemic, uh, the, uh, our virtual forums, this one, Zoom and others and Teams, have allowed us to remain productive when in, you know, just 20 years ago, it, it might have been impossible. And then finally, um, the digitization helps um, facilitate these critical values of humanitarian uh, assistance. Um, I will say that the Red Cross, the International Red Cross, includes impartiality and neutrality as two of their major uh, values, their core values. Um, and that, you know, when there's only a screen between you and not necessarily a person who's who may not be impartial or neutral, that's something that having access to the internet who doesn't know who you are, who doesn't care where you're coming from or what you look like or what ethnic group you're from or what religion, that is what digitization can help in terms of being impartial and neutral in the context of humanitarian aid and more generally. Next slide. So I want to share with you, um, this document was just released this month. It came to my attention this week. Um, and I would, I would recommend it. It's, it is by the United Nations um, Committee on Broadband. Um, and honestly, as leaders, and I see, let's see, I see 85 people um, on, this, um, on this webinar. And each one of you, I know in some respect or another, your leadership calls upon you to um, bring these tools of digitization um, both to your own constituencies, your own groups, but also as citizens, as leaders, um, as people who want to expand the reach of your effectiveness um, to those who may not have it now. Um, so I, 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 I found this report fascinating. Um, and I'm sharing with you these seven targets that the UN ha has set for itself in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals, um, but specifically with respect to um, digital opportunities. And I can imagine that these targets that they've set for the world have clear relevance to what you all are doing as leaders. Um, I will say number one, the UN's desire that all countries have a national broadband strategy. They actually hit that pretty quickly. And of course the Philippines has a, a broadband strategy that is not only established, but has, is, is funded. And I know a lot is going on now in, in uh, the leadership, the, the parliament, uh, uh, your, your government on broadband and digital. Um, but I think at least that part, certainly in the Philippines and also elsewhere in the world is all on its way. But, but the other targets have to do with affordability, um, particularly to marginalized groups, uh, pe internet penetration. And the latest number I've seen for the Philippines is actually much improved than from 10 years ago. And I think you're somewhere between this A and B level, um, it, broadband internet user penetration is a, uh, hovering about 70% and, and the goal is 75% worldwide. That's not, so that's pretty close. Uh, I think you'll be well beyond that by 2025. Um, skills, uh, within this report, there is a, um, 
one major reason why about a third of the people who don't use the internet say they don't use it is they just don't feel comfortable. They don't, you know, whether it's turning on the computer or, I mean, even I had trouble, you know, doing my own, um, my own, uh, PowerPoint um, here. Skills, you know, those of us who didn't grow up with it, our brains aren't wired for it, so we have to learn, and skills are essential within the workplaces, and leaders are always helping their, their the folks who report to them uh, supplement their skills. And then you, as finance professionals, will appreciate the absolute importance of digital financial services and how it just brings so many more people into the fold. I actually think this number's a little low, the 40% goal, um, but but I, uh, I think the more that we can rely on digital, we know certainly in this time of pandemic, um, we use so much less cash here in the United States, and I suspect the same is true in the Philippines. Uh, and S SMEs is the next goal to make sure that fewer and fewer micro and small enterprises are without are unconnected we want to get them connected and then finally the un is looking for gender equality across all these targets for example to reduce the gender the digital divide in access to the internet is just one obvious example um, so those are the broad targets for the un but i hope that you see some analogies in what you do for how we as leaders can help bring more people into this essential tool um, we talk about digital economy, but what is the economy? Uh, uh, it's all digital at this point. Um, so how can we just get more people to be able to explore and benefit from those opportunities? Next slide, please. Um, I don't necessarily have to repeat some of the things that have already been said about how hard, how very difficult this year has been. I mean, the world was 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 straight. It had a, glass was half full. I will I will grant that a lot has progress has happened in recent years, but but this has been a hard year. The crisis in public health in both of our countries has been devastating. As you know, the United States has just hit 200,000 deaths from COVID, and the world has hit a million. And then that's not even counting the cases and the disruption and the 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 risk faced by health health workers, it's been it's been awful. And, and you as leaders have faced it from so many angles, um, just coping with, with um, how we change our lives in response. Nothing is normal. Um, I mentioned earlier that existing inequalities have been terribly disrupted, um, whether it's you know for those who don't have connectivity, who can't get on a Zoom call, who can't visit their doctor over the internet, who can't, whose child can't be educated with the access to the internet, who, um, who aren't getting paid because their their jobs have disappeared for now. It's a terrible it's a terrible crisis with um, micro and small enterprises especially hard hit, with children increasingly vulnerable. Um, the interruptions to education are especially devastating, but also increasing as, as parents are distracted and, and um, children may not have this, and I'm talking all over the world, um, there's just greater exposure to abuse and exploitation. And certainly in the United States, one of the, uh, one of the sort of great worries has been that as people are confined to their homes, issues of gender-based violence has been exacerbated. So that's the bad news. Next slide, Let's, we can talk about some silver linings. Um, and we use the phrase, I, I think it's a political phrase, but you hear it in many contexts, which is we have the opportunity as leaders to build back better with digitization um, as uh, uh, paving the way. And I'm, again, I'm sure you do this already. I'm sure all, well, we, we are, here we are. We have reinvented how we come together to share information. And again, I'm just so impressed by Phoenix's commitment to uh, continuing its educational programs. You probably did some of them online before, but to, um, to be creative and innovative um, is, is really interesting. And it'll be interesting to see what you keep in the future and what you, you try to bring back because we miss seeing our friends and we miss hugging hello, um, and I hope we get that world back too, but we've certainly changed. Uh, we are more efficient, uh, I, I think, and, and, and on this issue, on efficiency and organizational flexibility, I recommend to all of you who are looking for ideas, who are looking for tactics or things that have worked elsewhere, the McKinsey Company um, and their free web sources, um, you know, they're a big multinational um, consultancy, 
boy, have they done some great intelligent work on COVID and, and how businesses are responding with so many, um, so much encouragement that we as uh, leaders or, or change agents, we can move faster. And the folks who report to us, they can move faster. And yes, there's something lost. But um, in these urgent times, when, when we just, the, the sooner we get, um, get our lives back, the better. There's a sense of urgency and, and a lot of um, folks have gotten on boards and a lot of company uh, have demonstrated just how to do that. Um, and, um, and then let me uh, pick one more thing out of this list, which is the strengthened e-governance. Um, I believe it was our, our, the, our committee chair uh, who mentioned earlier um, the dangers of official corruption. Um, and of course, with more e-governance, with citizens having a better chance to go to the internet to do their um, licensing, their permitting, whatever they need to do via e-governance, then we can cut out the corruption. It, it's at least a chance. Let's move on. Next slide. Um, I drummed up some interesting figures as we're contemplating what we want back, what we're heading toward, um, just some interesting numbers. Obviously, the Philippines was doing quite well in, in terms of economic growth before, uh, before COVID. And while, you know, 2020 is going to be terrible for everybody, um, I think one of the, the challenges will be to, to bring it back, um, but to bring it back in a more inclusive way and, and this new comfort level and accessibility of digital tools will be part of that. Um, and um, raising the percentage of households with internet, um, that figure there is old. I think it's already come up substantially from 2017, um, but still to get it higher and higher. Um, to, so, so I know with your complex geography, um, just accessing the internet is so critical and an extra challenge um, for, for the Philippines. But I hope that this has been a time for those, those quick solutions and innovative thinking to happen. Um, and uh, closing the gender gap. Now that's one that the United States is having a little bit more trouble with these days in the Philippines. Of course, Philippines is always a leader in the global gender re um, gap report. Um, so if anything, I think other countries will be looking to you all about how to keep um, the progress going in terms of narrowing digital divide, including through digitization and women's access to the internet. Let's go to the next slide. I know we don't have much time left. Um, I just want to highlight sort of the three areas where leaders get involved in digitizing. There's at the economy-wide level with your policymakers and your um, and, and even organizations such as yours that are advocating for strengthened um, legal and policy environment. There's at the intermediate uh, environments. I mean, obviously, your country is so geographically diverse. Um, there are going to be uh, across regions, there need to be differences um, and, and leaders within regions to um, strengthen the uh, ability for, for, for educators and businesses and others to access the internet. And then finally, at the firm level, and I will highlight um, the importance of technical knowledge, business knowledge, um, and even the appetite for risk that, that um, businesses are going to need to have in the future as you move on. And this is all in the context of, of doing more and doing better with uh, digitize, the, the digital networks and opportunities through digital digitization. And I think my final slide is coming up or my second to last slide is next. This is just a map of everything that will be before you. And some of these words will be familiar and some will be deeply intimidating, um, but, but the potential is vast. Of course, there are risks. And I know as finance professionals, you think about risks all the time. Um, but when we think about the opportunities, how we can bring more outcome, more equality, more opportunity, more sensitivity to the needs, not just of, of folks who have had a, you know, a, a, a relatively easy ride in life, but those who haven't, um, in the spirit of Ruth Bader Ginsburg from my end, all of this is within our power. And we, we can learn and we can work together to um, use it for good. And with that, I will, with my last slide, say thank you. Um, and just some scenes for you from the outpouring of grief and celebration of the life of a true leader, a true leader for change and equality, the kind of equality that I feel can continue to grow um, through digitization, um, both in economic growth and the humanitarian context. Thank you. I hope I didn't speak too long.
this was a great opportunity. Thank you, Louis. It, uh, you, you didn't speak long anyway. Anyway, uh, before we post our uh, questions uh, online, let me introduce to you uh, our moderator for today's webinar. Uh, our moderator is really a beauty entrepreneur, or, or as we will call her, a beautypreneur. Uh, she's a beauty and wellness women empowerment advocate, and uh, she owns two companies. She's the CEO of Demark Beauty Corporation, uh, which uh, markets and distributes uh, quality dermatology products backed by science and state-of-the-art technologies, and also Derm Asia Corporation, which is an aesthetic dermatology devices uh, company working closely with the, our aesthetic professionals as well as physicians in the country. And for her background, no, she did not graduate for, from any beauty school, but she is a manufacturing, engineering, and management uh, degree holder from the De La Salle University. And uh, just to add how talented she is, her gradu she graduated with a gold thesis doing a study on the computer simulated robotic arm as far back as more than 10 years ago. She's also an in-demand speaker. Uh, as I saw in her resume, she does about 10 to 20 uh, invitations in a year. And she's also very active in giving back to the community. Her CSR uh, uh, group uh, is about 10. Uh, I'll mention a few. Rotary Club of Makati, Am uh, Amcham Health and Wellness Committee, the Philippine Cancer Society, Habitat for Humanity, Angels uh, to Street Kids, Mother Teresa, Missionaries of Charity, Alay ng Puso, and Go Negosyo. And for her professional uh, affiliations, uh, of course, aside from Phoenix, she's also uh, affiliated with at least 10 organizations, to name them, Management Association of the Philippines, Federation of Philippine, Filipino Chinese Chamber of Commerce, Philippine Chamber of Commerce, AMCHAM, American Chamber of Commerce in the Philippines, the Filipina Women's Network, Philippine Retailers Association, the European Chamber of Commerce in the Philippines, Digital Commerce Association of the Philippines. And I love this in her resume. Her best personal interest is commitment to her two sons' future. Uh, may we welcome our moderator for today, Ms. Nikki Tang. Thank you. Yes. Okay, I'm on. Thank you very much, Edith, for such a very warm introduction. And of course, a great morning to everyone. It is my pleasure to be your moderator for today's webinar, and I would like to thank our lovely guests, Vina Francisco and Louise Williams, and special thanks to Louise for spending your evening time all the way from North Carolina um, this moment, this hour. Anyway, so what the fabulous insights we've seen from our two esteemed pioneers for such a very engaging and practical presentations. Uh, dear audience, if you have any questions, please feel free to send them in. And indeed, uh, our two speakers have shared very relevant uh, information during these unprecedented and but very exciting times. I totally agree that digitalization is for an enabler for development, especially during this global pandemic crisis. And it is through effective high potential leadership, businesses will safely navigate these times and reinvent themselves successfully for the future. So it has really been a very inspiring, it, it draws a lot of thinking and debate. And now ladies, it's time for our questions from our audience this morning. Uh, I'd like to throw the first one, okay? I would like to say that the exercise tool, Vina from Vina, our first speaker, you made us do this very morning uh, in thoughts, okay? It's very useful to guide us. So Vina, the first question I'd like to ask, you mentioned that there's a difference between high performance and high potential leaders. Mm -hmm. Out of the many skills of a high potential leader, which do you think have become most prevalent for leaders in the COVID-19 times? Okay, so of the seven dimensions, I, I believe the dimension that's most highlighted now is uh, the dimension that talks about 
being comfortable with change. Um, because somebody who is comfortable with change will be open to new ideas, will be open to uh, innovation, uh, will not panic in this age of disruption, will be open to digitalization. So, and that's on the technical side, right? But a person who's also comfortable with change is able to adjust as a leader in managing the change that his or her team is going through, right? So emotional intelligence also comes in with that. I heard Lo Lois talk about you know, just the physical and the mental uh, impacts of this crisis on people. Now, in reality, that impact is actually invisible. Because how many people do you think are actually going to be brave enough to come forward to say, I'm overwhelmed, I'm depressed, I can't focus. It takes a lot of courage, right? And trust for somebody to be able to come out of themselves to actually admit that. So a leader who is comfortable with change will consider all those different dynamics, right? The technical aspect of the work, the emotional aspect, the mental aspect, you know, the physical tiredness, right? That everybody feels through this time. So, and that, as I mentioned in, in, my, in my earlier um, uh, presentation is, that's really the test, right? So as leaders, watch your people. Who is the most comfortable in, in, in this crisis? Because that is a skill that may not necessarily be tested, right? Under normal conditions. But it's a very good time now to observe and test that skill, you know, among your team members. Okay. Thank yeah, you. I'll stop here. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure uh, companies look not, uh, for now look for managers or leaders, employees, staff who can move from being an acknowledged value creator to even become a game changer, as you said. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, yeah. And so moving forward, what changes, Vina, have you seen in the leadership style from traditional to modern that has helped leaders excel in your experience, in your journey? Okay, you know, I think, um, I think the changes are very apparent generationally. <laughs> and I, I heard um, Mr. Pasqual, uh, you know, refer to that, right? You have the Gen X, you have, uh, you know, uh, the baby boomers all in the same workforce. And I think everybody's adjusting differently. When I look at traditional leaders, their shift right to the digital digital platform is a little slower. Okay. Uh, for Gen X, you know Gen Y, they've been operating in this platform on social media, right, for many years. So for them, you know, the shift is almost invisible. Um, where the challenge I believe is for traditional leaders who like the face-to-face is how do they stay effective as a leader? How do they stay engaged with their staff when they can only see them on Zoom, right? Or on video conferencing or on, uh, you know, Teams? You know, how do you keep that uh, emotional, right? And mental connection with, with your staff? So that I think is the biggest challenge. Um, in ADB, we've hired over 60, 240 people this year, we've hired about 60 international staff through the lockdown, but none of them are moving to Manila. Mm -hmm. They're staying where they are. So even the beginning of the relationship is virtual. Mm -hmm. So for leaders who are now transitioning from a face-to-face -to, -face to a virtual relationship, that's easier. But to commence a relationship from day one virtually, that requires a whole other skill set. So I actually came up with a tip sheet, <laughs> a quick cheat sheet for leaders to say, how do you onboard, right? A virtual staff from day one. You know, what are the, some of the, some of the, the best practices uh, that you have to put into place to try and make this as effective and as workable as possible? Very, very insightful and very, uh, thank you. So again, for the tool, the sheet that you send us and I encourage everyone out there to start working on them. And I, I understand, Vina, that this is not like a one time and you can do this regularly on a frequency basis. So uh, I would like to ask this question now to both our speakers, Vina and Louise. Um, feel, please feel free uh, to give your thoughts. How do you think you enable and best entertain an enterprising spirit, meaning searching for productive ways to blaze new paths 
when making organizations are having risk. And you mentioned earlier, you know, the finance uh, world is full of risk as well. So carefully. Perhaps Louis can start go ahead first. Sure. Um, great question. I think it has to do with um, letting people play to their strengths. There, and, and this is not necessarily a, uni, a universal feeling about leadership or, 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 or management, but I, I personally feel that while we all can use uh, training, professional development, uh, feedback on what we can do better, what gives us joy? What is our passion? It's what we often what we do well. Um, and so if, if I were to maximize, uh, aiming to maximize the, um, for example, in the digital context, um, uh, you saw in my PowerPoint, there's so many directions someone can go in, um, whether it's education or health and whether it's content, whether it's the technical side, do what you want, do what you do well, go with your strengths. Um, and that I think is risk minimizing in its own way. Thank you, Louise. Any, any words from you, Bina? Uh, you know what, sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> I was so distracted by Lois's response. I was listening so intently. So it was just a question of how do you enable and best entertain an enterprising spirit when making organizations are actually having so much risk, especially during these global pandemic times. Yeah. So how can we have uh, having risk so carefully for the organization? Yes. You know what I think has been um, uh, very inspirational for at least us in ADB, which has, uh, you know, kept that enterprising spirit alive, is ADB quickly went into the mode of COVID emergency assistance, right? So uh, early on in the pandemic, even just in the Philippines, uh, ADB came up with uh, $5 million worth of food aid. Now, ADB is not in the food aid business. We don't do that, right? We are an infrastructure bank. So our projects are in the billions of dollars. We build, build roads, bridges, you know, uh, uh, transport, railways. Mm -hmm. um, we're not in the food business, but the need for that was very apparent, especially in the early days of the lockdown in the Philippines. So that enterprising spirit made ADB jump in and say, we're gonna do this. And that, that uh, release of the five million dollars was done in record speed record speed we never we don't usually work that quickly right so uh, again we're not also in the business of medical aid but very quickly 20 million dollars um, was put in place to purchase a testing lab from China right and by April 22nd that testing lab arrived in the Philippines and was set up in a hospital um, in Pampanga about two hours outside of Manila so uh, the enterprising spirit, I think, has been revved up because of that, that inspiration and that desire, right, uh, to be part of the solution, right, rather than, you know, sticking to our bureaucratic ways uh, of normally doing things. Thanks to people like you and, you know, and Louise for really working so hard, passionately giving back to the society. So there are some questions right now that I would like to ask uh, for Vina with the new normal, where physical face-to-face -face interaction is limited, hard to assess if indeed you are an effective leader in a virtual world. Mm -hmm. Is ADBHR reassessing, reassessing its competency framework for its managers, leaders, taking into account effectiveness as leaders in the highly virtual world? Okay, you know, it's, um, that's a whole other realm of, of HR, right? Um, what I gave you this morning was technically my elevator speech, right? But there's so much work that goes into HR, especially in times of crisis. Now, that's a question that's on our radar. You know, how do you actually assess people uh, through this crisis, given that the, the lockdown started in March and, uh, you know, we review on a 12 month basis. So how do you review people for the next nine months? Uh, the year end review for us in December, that's still up in the air. But what did we do for the six month review, which happened in June? So first three months in the office and the next three months virtual. 
what we did was we actually adjusted the mid-year performance review. So instead of staying with the standard competencies, here are the things that you're measured on, right? Every single person is measured on year over year. We actually changed our mid-year approach and we asked two questions. The first question is, how are you doing with your priorities? What are the top three priorities that you focused on for the last six months? Tell us about that. And the second question was, uh, how are you managing yourself and your work? through the pandemic. So as you can see, it was twofold. The first question was technical in nature, and the second question was the how, right? Which from an HR perspective uh, is very important. That's always part of my standard coaching. When you look at performance, you always look at two things. It's not just what they did, it's how they did it. So a uh, short answer is we simplified the assessment review for mid-year and we only asked two questions. What, what are your, how are you doing on your priorities and how are you managing through the pandemic? Uh, what we're gonna do for the end of the year that's still up in the air. So it's quality over yeah. Yeah. So, uh, And it's getting to understand better and you know, deeper. The, I think communication is really very crucial in this case and that's really great to know that uh, that's how you've been doing one of your best practices. I have another question here for our speaker, Louis. What are, key new legislations that countries should look into to enhance our sustainability and resilience under the new normal? Louis? I'm mute. <laughs> yes. Um, so I would return to that, that list of targets that I provided in, the, in my PowerPoint, uh, which really focus on accessibility um, not uh, certainly to the internet, um, but to services generally, um, to think about, you know, uh, w we talk about diversity and inclusion when we're trying to solve a problem, ensure that we're thinking not just of, you know, the people in our own circles, but how the solutions for accessibility impact everyone. Um, skills, it's always a matter of skills. I don't think one can prioritize um, uh, not just basic education, but continuing education. And honestly, I, I salute the private sector in this context for, for being part of that push toward enhancing skills. Uh, um, again, I think one thing the Philippines excels at is uh, embracing education as, as a whole life experience and not just something that, you know, you, you, it happens in, until you go to high school and then, and then you see what happens next. Um, and of affordability of, of access, uh, particularly to the internet is essential and the government's responsibility to look into that. Um, and then finally, as mentioned before, I, I honestly feel that e-governance, people do want a human touch. And I, I, I think there's an interesting connection between our two talks. Um, if there aren't human beings uh, at the other end of government services, you're really missing something. Um, but at the same time, e-governance and, and cutting the middle people to the extent possible so, so business can continue without interference and without corruption is a, should be a, a government priority anyway. I totally agree. And the importance cannot be underestimated. And that's a very, very great way to look at it. Okay, so um, there's another question coming from our audience this morning. How do you create or establish the corporate culture when the physical distance may be here for a longer time? It may even be easier to those who have been together prior to the lockdown, but for new employees, how do we really do it? How do we manage it? I think this is a question to any of our speakers this morning. I think it's for Vina. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, no, that, that, that is a challenge. Um, it's, it's the virtual onboarding uh, that I talked about, that I talked about earlier. And it really, it's a two way street. Um, it requires a lot of work from the manager uh, to keep themselves engaged and to keep the staff engaged. So as I've been interviewing through this pandemic, that is actually one of the questions that I've asked, right? Have you ever worked in a virtual environment? Have you ever had a virtual work relationship, right? Because past experience, past performance is the best indicator for future performance. So somebody who's done it before will be able to adjust, right? Somebody who has not done it before will have difficulty. So in a way, it's a wait and see for us. 
right? We have to wait and see in six months, in a year, to see how well we did in, in virtual onboarding and how well that new hire right, did in the new. So it's also a new paradigm for us. Um, there's gonna be very interesting learnings uh, and conclusions, you know, but maybe we're about a year away from being more definitive about that. So um, following to that, listening to your talk earlier, Vina, I'm sure a lot of us out here would also like and very curious to know, uh, what is more important in your opinion, having high education certification or real world experience in shaping high potential leader? Mm. How, and how is this connected to the it or X factor that you shared earlier? Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, I think it depends on where you are in your career. So if you don't have a lot of work experience under your belt, employers will gravitate towards your educational background. Uh, especially if, for example, if you're, if you're a, a few years under your belt, but the position's an engineering position, you have an engineering degree, then you'll be very attractive. But I believe the further you are in your career, uh, if you're at mid-career, um, which would mean maybe eight, nine, 10, or more years of experience under your belt, then your actual experience, I believe, trumps, trumps your education. Because as you heard me say earlier, right, past performance is the best indicator of future performance. And again, when I talked about diversity of experience, somebody might end up with uh, a, a degree in um, in English, right? English literature, but they didn't pursue a career as a professor or a teacher or a writer, right? They might have pursued a, a career as an investment specialist, you know, somehow along the path. So if you can see, there's really no connection anymore between the education and what their expertise turned out to be. So me as a, uh, as a uh, recruiter, and because I do hire for international staff for ADB, uh, I do tend to look at what they've done in their careers more than, more than education. Yeah. So it's a very great perspective to hear. And um, you know, it's very insightful for such a very challenging times to hear that um, the experience really, developing skills and experience would really make a lot of difference in uh, you know, now and towards the future. Mm -hmm. um, Luis, currently, uh, being the senior director for the economic growth of DP Global, there are two questions I would like to throw, one from my end and another from the audience. What would be your company if there are company engagements in the Philippines at the moment? And what would you recommend to the Philippine government if you were to be consulted? Give at least uh, top three things. Uh, yeah, so I should say my firm, DT Global, and honestly, friends, I started my job about 10 days ago. Um, I, was, <laughs> I, was doing, I was very happily working as a consultant, but a very good friend of mine who I respect quite a bit called me about, about this firm, which um, though it formed formally um, in July 2019, it was an amalgamation of two, um, two other firms. Uh, in fact, the small business sort of bought the, the development arm of a long established uh, a, a firm with 50 years of history in international development with an emphasis on inf infrastructure. So it's a really interesting combination and it's been exciting to join a firm that has given a lot of thought to systems and, you know, talk about digitalization. Um, a lot of companies are trying to do this midstream and it's been a pleasure to, to kind of jump in where they've got all these systems and, and, and certainly during the pandemic and it's all before me, which is really nice. A lot of institutional knowledge, a lot of good, strong practices of knowledge management, which I think all firms are going to increasingly need to rely on rather than having, you know, things in a thousand different files. In terms of the Philippines, uh, sadly, I'm new enough to the firm that I can't remember. But yes, they're deeply experienced, I think mostly on infrastructure issues um, in the Philippines. Um, as for the government of the Philippines itself, um, I, uh, interesting to see as I looked at the global, um, the, the gender, the, the global gender gap. Um, of course, the Philippines has flying colors and everything. Um, 
maybe not as many women politicians or women running for office. And that's not something the government can do, but it's something I always encourage women to do. I mean, you know, of the, the 80 plus people who came to this webinar, I'm wondering how many of them think about running for office because, it, I, you know, as Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, I want to see equal women, if not more women, it's our turn. So that's that's finally a change and then and then accessibility this is something well within the philippines ca capability um there are issues of competition um that and an opportunity i know law is being considered now but um you know anything that can that can bolster the accessibility of the internet in your far-flung populations uh, is a gift to your own economy the end <laughs> Thank you, Louise. And, um, you know, still about our country, the Philippines, and since you mentioned Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So for our country, the Philippines, which of the economic drivers do you have more concern over than, that needs to be addressed through digitalization? And uh, we, on your first slide, I'm very inspired to ask you also, how would you summarize the impact of the late RBD um, as a leader in humanitarian change? So I'll answer the second uh, part first, um, because that's a people. There has been a lot of discussion about her legacy and what it means. And what I will say is that um, her first critical case. Um, I, it's the one where um, she argued for, she actually argued on behalf of a man, that a man should have the opportunity to get um, the benefits that, that, widow, that, that a man who's lost his wife should get the same benefits that a, a woman who's lost her husband should get. She says, what's the difference, um, you know, if somebody's taking care of children? Um, and, but, and that was in the early 1970s. And then, of course, she joined the court, I think, in 1990. Her legacy is having girls and women and men too think so much more broadly about the contribution of women to the economies and so to our economy and to our society. And, um, you know, just the way people think that they can, what, what little girls want to be when they grow up has changed in my lifetime because it's, you know, I'm older than. 1971. <laughs> um, but anyway, as for the Philippines, and, and I mean, I don't, I, I don't frankly have any targeted suggestions, but I will say this, the Philippines is very um, active in APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, both as a leader and an observer. That, that, that forum is a remarkable place for good practices, good ideas. So I think the Philippines should be sharing their good ideas and then learning from the excellent ideas of other economies that participate in APEC. Thank you. And actually, we're running out of time, so I will just have two more questions. I will throw in one for Vina and then one for Luis as well. To Vina, how can you encourage managers to check the work-life balance of their team in a company where there is always high pressure to perform? Okay, I was actually uh, trying to type that, that response um, on the chat box. Now, um, how do you check the work-life balance of your team? Uh, that can also be challenging. Unless the staff offers up information, right, it's also difficult for you to ask because you also have to respect, right, the privacy of the person. So personally, what I do with my team is I, uh, I encourage the work-life balance by telling them, take your leaves, right? Don't forget, just because you're working from home, it doesn't mean that you're not entitled to vacation leave. So take your leaves. I'm also very flexible when it comes to how they structure their workday. So for example, in ADB, we have this system where if you need to be out for an hour, two hours, you have to report it. And I've actually told my team through the pandemic, I'm not tracking anybody on an hour by hour basis. Okay, I trust you, you know what you need to get done. If you need to take an hour here and there, just tell me you're not available, do what you have to do and just get back. I even tell them, don't even file the time. Okay, don't tell ADB I'm saying that, but I tell them, don't even file the time because we're not working in this normal nine to five. So, you know, I have my team emailing me at 11 o'clock at night. And even if I'm dying to reply, I don't because I don't want to fall into this pattern where we're talking to each other and working at 11 o'clock at night, right? So I tell them, don't do it, right? But I also know 
that it makes them feel better to do that because the kids are now in bed and they want to get back on their computer. So I tease them about it, but I'm also not a don't do that. You know, I'm like, do what you feel is comfortable. I'm very flexible about time. I get into chats with them. I tell them what's going on with me. And if that encourages them to share, great. Um, but if not, then that's okay too. So I just operate on the assumption that everybody has a challenge. Right. And I think and I operate that way. They don't have to tell me. Yeah. And I think especially now, the, compo the element, the idea of discipline, the value of discipline couldn't be, even be more stressed how important it is to yeah. um, understand, you know, the, the time for this and the, uh, there's a time for everything. And uh, the last question we have today for our other speaker, Luis, um, I received this question earlier. Filipinos rank 52nd and out of the 156 in terms of world happiness. This is quite disappointing considering that Filipinos are known for their patience and resiliency. So what is the basis of the happiness index? And especially now that the country is experiencing loss of jobs by the millions, may ha many have also mental imbalances due to the fear of the COVID-19. Can you enlighten us on this, Luis, please? Yes. Um, we sure on mute. Okay. Oh. Okay. Um, You're okay now. Uh, You're okay now. You can hear me now. Okay. Um, yes. So yes. the happiness, um, the happiness index is relatively new. Interesting that it's a UN product, um, and I will tell you, it measures social support networks, social trust, honest governments, safe environments, and healthy lives. And um, I agree that that doesn't necessarily capture um, some of the, the beautiful things about the Philippines that is, I, I would agree, you are world famous for, for, for your upbeat sort of magical half glass half full attitude. Um, but that at the same time, I mean, I think I, I did hear a little bit about the local government units and, and, and corruption. Um, you know, if, if folks are dealing with, with, with frustrating corruption every day, that, that is a huge drag on happiness, um, if, if that's an issue. Um, and um, so 52 isn't that bad. I mean, that's out of, it's still, you're still top, top third. Um, but yes, I think if you look at those, those metrics, those are where they can improve. Well, now we know better. So okay. at this point, <laughs> thank you so much, Luis. And at this point, I would like to ask our wonderful guest to share your final thoughts and sentiments, if at all, and advice to any to everybody listening with us today before we wrap up. The, yeah. Any final words? Um, okay, I can start. Um, final words is uh, from a very um, personal level as individuals, uh, there's a lot that you can learn about yourself um, in a crisis. So, you know, also be very observant of yourselves. I know you're all leaders and you're taking care of teams and a lot of people in your organizations, but also be very self-reflective on yourself as a person. What are you learning about yourself as a person? Are there things that, you know, has made you more proud of yourself? You know, are there things that you realize are weaknesses and maybe you'd like to, to work on? Um, so be reflective about that. Um, and I say that in, in all honesty, it's something I learned about myself in 9-11, after 9-11. And after that, I actually realized that, whoa, I like myself a lot. <laughs> you know, I like myself as a person when I stop to reflect what I learned about myself through that experience and how it has really transformed me, right, in the person that I am today. So take that time for yourselves, right? The best leaders, remember, are leaders who know their self-worth. So don't forget to take care of yourselves as well. Thank you, Tina. May we hear some words from you, also inspiring words from Luis. <laughs> Well, I'll return to the, the glass half full 
um, concept. Obviously, digitalization is a very incredibly complex topic, and and honestly, I'm I'm Gen X, and I and it's scary for me. I can only imagine how the the baby boomers feel, but but there's so much potential, and I think you know if if we see it as helpful, if we understand that there's so many ways to plug in to take to bring our our personal um, comfort level, our personal talents, our gifts. There's so many areas where we can help get it to everybody. It, it will only, that glass will only be truly full when it's accessible safely to everybody and it is within our power. Yeah. And I agree to that because right now opportunities is definitely limited, limitless. I mean, the world is in your hands. So a big thank you ladies and I wish we really have more time to share and listen more from our guests. Mm -hmm. like, it's been a great to learn about the positive impacts to our world, our businesses, even our families at home with the digitization technology and have its true importance for all of us. It has truly been enlightening to understand how shifts in leadership mentality and time spent understanding the real needs of our teams can bring positive change to organizations and the importance of transformation and change within businesses to successfully navigate this unpredictable and uncertain world we face. Our leaders of the future will never be more in need or valued and to be able to identify who they are and how to make them is the best they can be is fundamental to our future high potential leaders, so to speak, are an even more valuable asset. So both discussions we have this morning have certainly made all of us more enlightened and feel confident to embrace <laughs> and its opportunities and let's all walk away with something to think about thank you again uh, ladies thank okay you well <laughs> that was a very engaging discussion so thank you to our esteemed speakers uh, Luis and Vina and of course to Nikki uh, you're you're a great discovery for women in finance and for Phoenix so you now have a new career as the moderator uh, in the future Phoenix uh, activities so thanks to Gay for actually uh, pushing you to uh, be the moderator for this afternoon uh, for, for this morning rather okay so down to our final and I think one of the most important parts of our program so um, as we all know um, Gay is a very active member of Phoenix and Women in Finance and the other committees. Um, and she's actually known to be the financial inclusion advocate. So she herself is also a very favorite uh, resource speaker in, in most of the fora that we're having, not only within Phoenix, but also outside of Phoenix. So she's connected with the uh, International Monetary Fund. And... Oh. and uh, and very, very uh, helpful in educating all of us. So with, without uh, further taking time from her, so let me uh, introduce to you and turn you over to Gay Santos. Okay, Gay. So good afternoon. Have... good afternoon, everyone. Actually, um, Larry, I'm not connected with International Monetary Fund. Um, actually, co was connected with the International Finance Corporation of the World Bank Group. Oh, okay. Um, so 25, more than 25 years there, um, DC and here, um, but retired last year. But anyway, going back to the forum, a pleasant good afternoon mm -hmm. to everyone. I'm grateful to Luis and Vina for sharing their insights and stories. You enlightened us that in these times of challenges, we should be hopeful. Resources are scarce these days, but there are two resources that are within our reach, human resources and technology to weather this pandemic while promoting greater humanity. Women, particularly mothers in the Filipino context, are regarded as ilaw ng tahanan, the guiding light of the family. As we all face this pandemic, one thing is clear. We need stories, messages of hope, resilience, and inspiration. Women can truly be the source, that source of hope, resilience, and inspiration. Women women to be that guiding light, not just for their respective families, but for the community as a whole to weather through this pandemic. Thank you all for joining us today. I trust that you learned a lot from this forum and please join us in our next forum. Um, if we can kindly flash um, the announcement for the next forum. 
Um, it is on October 13, um, the future of MFIs and a focus on women. This forum will bring the uh, will feature the latest study from the Brookings Institution on the future of microfinance. You will hear directly from the authors themselves. Thank you once again. Keep well and God bless. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. So thank, you. thank you. Bye. Bye. Excellent. Thank you, Bina. Bina. Thank you, Bina. Thank you, Thank you, Louis. Thank you, Louis. Everyone. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Oh. <laughs>